Ezra Pound speaking, Radio Speeches of World War II. Edited by Leonard W. Dube. Number 17, March 19, 1942. UK, B-21. And the time lag. Speaking of fan mail, I got a funny looking card the other day headed Kriegsstadtlog 21A with the prisoner's number running up into the thousands. Dear Mr. Pound, if this card reaches you and you can manage it, I would be very grateful if you will send me one or two of your recent works on economics. Reading matter from England rather scarce at present and not very enlightening. Signed, so and so. Well, maybe this is all very flattering, but the point is the time lag. If a man has to be made a prisoner of war before he will read my works on economics, what good does it do him? Or let us say, what immediate good? Of course, he may be getting ready to make a home fit for a hero in a new order, England, when he gets out of the Gefangenen lager. But wouldn't it have been a sight easier if he and his 12,000 fellow recliners in the Gefangenen lager had started reading my economics just a bit sooner? I ask particularly my American hearers whether the start on the new economics which would have prevented the war and let the now so mangy old worm-eaten Trafalgar lion go on lying down with the French rooster and the assorted eagles of Europe and left the old killy-loo bird screeching away on the 4th of July every summer and no bone broken and a lot fewer oil ships sunk and more cars on the American roads and more rubber for tires and abundance no longer potential but real wouldn't it have been a bit nicer Mr. Brown, known as Buffalo Bill, telling you I am in propaganda. Wow, damn it all, I was running the same propaganda back before Hitler became Chancellor of the Reich. I don't mean I dug down into it, not down to the bottom. I was leading the pleasant life, and to men like Hitler and Mussolini, if they had ever got wind of my being here, they would have thought me a possibly harmless eccentric. However, in my perlite and refined manner, I did try to do a spot of work educating here or there, putting in a drop of enlightenment. I didn't go in hell for leather. Economics exclusive, straight at once. I had to find out how the old show was running, running down. I say it was running down. I began to say that in my poetry. Quote, this land turns evil slowly, unquote. Treating it by way of young man's intuition, I said something about getting the sense of a city, like the savage hunter has the sense of the forest. Something was running down. There is a poem, not by me, back in blast, about a mud hydro that was healthy mud by comparison. Then after I saw it was bad, I began to wonder how you could fix it. After ten years asking questions, asking them of bank lawyers, asking them of Max Pam or any other wise guy I could get near to, after ten years, as I say, I began to get top sides with the subject. Usury, profits, monopolization of money. Then I began digging into American history and other history. All there, plain as a biscuit, with the means of telling you people that was the question. O oh, Hamlet, O oh, village Hamlets, 
big papers did not want open discussion. It had to be bootlegged. Then there was education, beginning with the top shelves of the colleges. I'm going to quote from a paper with an equine title printed out in Wisconsin, a little magazine, the kind that comes up alive and dies down, usually rather sudden, inside a couple of years. Along in the spring of 1935, I came up with this answer to those young editors in their quarterly as follows. The best I can do in reply to yours is to offer programs recalling a few facts. For 30 years I have been trying to reorganize the study of literature so that it would be of some use to the student and for 15 I have been trying to reorganize education in general to the same end. The best I can tell you to date is contained in my ABC of reading and in my ABC of economics with the volumes following it, social credit and impact, Jefferson and or Mussolini. Why aren't they used as your textbooks? For advanced students, there is my make it new, which must be correlated with my ABCs of reading if you are clearly to see what it is driving at. If American students will recognize that universities are there to prepare students for life in a given country and in a given time and insist on finding out what will help them to live in that place and time, they can get their four years worth. Nobody can do this for the students. They have got to do it for themselves. Quote, Mary Hopkins on one end of the log and the student on the other, unquote. When Abelard was kicked out of the University of Paris, 5,000 students followed him into the country, where there were no dormitories and million-dollar gymnasia. That is the sort of thing that spells a revival of learning or intellectual rebirth. My generation was brought up ham ignorant of economics. History was taught with omissions of the most vital facts. Every page our generation read was overshadowed by usury. Not only was the press false, but every current idea had been warped by generations of antecedent perversion. The acid test of public men today is plain and simple. Mistrust any man, no matter how high in office, who tries to get you away from the questions, what is money? Who makes it? How is it issued? Why can't the whole people buy what the whole people produces. Start on that at once and throw out any man who won't give you a straight answer. You cannot cure Wisconsin in Pekin. I mean start where you are. Don't let anyone wriggle out of local honesty by talking internationally. Investigate the Carnegie Peace Foundation. When you find out why they avoid the study of economic causes of war, you'll be part way toward preventing another. Printed in Wisconsin in the spring of 1935, long before Hitler was so influential in world affairs. You can lead a rocking horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. And young Americans' problem is what was young England's problem. And the answers were known. The answers could have been broadcast. The answers could have been printed in daily papers. They could have been taught in the schools. They could have been used as the basis for action. I mean political action. And what prevented it? Well, go ask yourselves what prevented it. Ask yourselves why these things were not widely printed, 
why the real thought of the American founders was hidden, stuffed into corners, why every man in England who foresaw disaster and who saw how England could have avoided it if, why these men were not heeded, why they were hugger-muggered out of the way, or reduced, shall we say, often by fear into silence. Not all were afraid, some were prudent. Where are they? Some of them got out in front. Now, where are they? Where are the backseaters, the men who knew but saw no way to act on their knowledge? The men who assembled tiny minorities? Well, where are they? And when will the people learn wisdom? O oh, Zeus, O oh, Chanti, how long is the time lag? End of number 17. And the time lag. Ezra Pound speaking, radio speeches of World War II.